I don't bleed anymore. They were watching me, and every move I made, I wouldn't let them know that I knew they were there. In a catatonic trance, I watched a monarch butterfly fly into my bedroom window, landing on my left ring finger as I laid in my bed. I didn't move, I just watched it, and the sense of freedom it possessed. A breeze blew in and rattled my hanging dream catchers hanging from my ceiling. They swayed, all of them in their rainbow colors, red, purple, orange, yellow, green, and blue. The butterfly floated across the room toward an old movie poster from The Wizard of Oz. I didn't move, even when I heard the vibration rushing through my bones as I floated from my bed up to the ceiling in a trance. The clocks on the wall around me seemed to melt into the walls, and I closed my eyes with pain surging suddenly from every part of me. My body remained in that position until I felt myself back in my bed. I looked around and sat up with sweat dripping from my back and forehead. It was getting hard now to stop them. What did they want? My life had become strange, and even now as I wake from the stream, I can feel my body as though it is no longer a part of me. This is the here and now, but once upon a time, I was normal, just like you. I had weird roommates in the past, like in college when I roomed with a girl from Russia who got pissed if I ran the water when I brushed my teeth. But none ever as strange as when I bought Henley House to restore it to its previous splendor. I had been in the business of repairing homes for years with my late husband Mitchell before he passed away in a car accident. In that one instant, my life changed forever, and no one can prepare you for that. Luckily, our finances were okay and in excellent condition, so money wasn't an issue. But the night terrors and the anxiety started and kept getting worse from that day forward. I had switched my medication a few times until my doctor finally got the concoction just right. Following my husband's tragic death, I ended up feeling an overwhelming need for a change. And so I bought an old property not far from Kent, Ohio. It was livable, but it needed to be restored badly. I was game for a new project, and so I started renovating the house on my own with a little outside help. It began to take up most of my spare time, and eventually the house became harder to finance as one leaky pipe turned into new floorboards and a new roof. The house had so many things that needed to be worked on, and just when I fixed something, another something broke. The costly project was causing me to blow through my savings in rapid succession. When I finished the back of the house and two of the bedrooms, a friend of mine, Mary Ann, who was over for a long overdue wine night, suggested I get a roommate. Shelby, there are a lot of people out there that do that now. Look, you already have half the house finished and an extra bedroom with an ensuite. You may as well make the most of it, then it can pay for the rest of the renovations to get this old place going. For once, you may be onto something, Marianne. I laughed, pouring her another glass of wine. I thought about it, and then I advertised on a website that had great reviews for finding potential housemates. I got an email one afternoon from a man by the name of James Connor. He wasn't bad looking. He was 27 years old and worked as an engineer for an aeronautics company. He explained he had just moved to Ohio from Houston to start a new project for a company here in Ohio. He stated he needed a place to stay for roughly five months while he looked for a house of his own. I reviewed his email several times before getting brave enough to email him back to set up a meeting to see if this potential new roommate was a suitable match. A day or so later, he emailed me asking if Friday around 2 p.m. would be a good time to discuss our potentially new roommate status. We met at a local coffee shop in downtown Kent, Ohio, and I immediately liked him. He was very thoughtful, and while young, very intelligent. I didn't feel threatened in the least, and he was one of the few men I had met in the last year or so since James had passed that didn't make me think he had ulterior motives for wanting to meet me. I wasn't interested in dating anyone, and especially not someone ten years my junior. So after a couple of cups of coffee and pleasant conversation about his job, where he went to school, and what his housing needs were, we decided it was worth setting up a time for him to come by and visit Henley House. Two days later, he was presented with a tour of the old place and I explained that currently half of the house was finished, but that the rest of it was still in the process of being completed. 
It's a beautiful old house. If you ever need any help with anything, just let me know. He had smiled as I took him around and showed him the room he would be renting. Of course, I said, walking into his would-be room. I think I'll take it. I like it here because it reminds me of the house I grew up in. He smiled and reached for his checkbook and wrote a check immediately. It wasn't more than a week or so later and he was moved in and settled. James was quiet and reserved and spent a lot of time on his computer working. He and I got along very well, and he even helped me out with the painting of the other side of the house. This was in the beginning, but then, slowly, things took a turn for the weird. At first, it began with James just acting strange, such as spending more extended hours in his room. Eventually, it was as though he never left. Slowly, over time, it got worse, and James started to get the mail before I could grab it and put it under his door. He began to stand out on the front porch and wait till the mailman was around, and then run to catch it from him. I didn't know what to do because I thought maybe James was just excited about something he bought. However, slowly, over time, it got weirder. He would get frantic around the time the mailman would come, and then he would pace back and forth, sometimes sweating profusely until the mail carrier gave him the mail. I would oftentimes find things addressed to me scattered or thrown onto the front porch and lawn. Sometimes he would throw my mail onto the kitchen counter and then run back to his room, locking the door. It was an annoyingly frequent occurrence that I decided to tell James that perhaps he should obtain a P.O. box. I didn't want him interfering in my mail, and I didn't want him thinking I was interfering in his. A few months after James moved in, he became more withdrawn and disinterested in me and the world outside of his room. Besides his new reclusive behavior, his rent slowly got later and later till I had to confront him. James, I had begun after seeing him leave his room one afternoon. Can we talk? Is this about the rent I owe? I'm sorry, let me get my checkbook. He had said going back into his room and then shutting the door behind him and locking it. I stood there waiting for him to come back, but after about 15 minutes, he was still in his room. He never returned and in fact just stayed in his room for the next two days. He ended up sneaking out of the house two days later while I was at the grocery store, and I did not see James for several days. Renting the room out to James was slowly becoming the worst decision I had made thus far. The turn finally came when he did come back home. He had given me a check for half of the rent that was due. James, this is only $300. Your rent is $650. He looked at me, and when I looked back at him, he had a dark look on his face. His eyes seemed so menacing, as though he was suddenly angry. Look, sorry, I've been dealing with things at work. I am sorry. He seemed sincere, and I tried not to be rude because he had been so friendly and helpful up until recently. I gave him a nod, looking at the check, then at him. He looked dirty, with greasy hair, and had what looked like the same clothes on as the last time I had seen him. I had no idea what was going on with James, but I also felt compelled to help him. Can you make the rest of the rent by the 15th? I don't want to make an issue of it, because I mean... We all have bad times, I said sympathetically. He smiled at me, then went back inside his room. A few days later, he came out, clean-shaven, nice slacks, and a new dress shirt. He was back to normal again. He even paid the remainder of his rent in cash and wrote me a check for the following month. He even started helping again around the house, and one evening he came into the kitchen while I was cooking and offered to help. Shelby, it smells great. Is it salmon with a ginger dressing of some sort? Oh yeah, I made it with a few different ingredients, but yes, ginger is a part of it. Would you like to have dinner with me? I'm more of a vegetarian now, but I wouldn't mind eating the salad with you, he laughed. We sat and had our dinner with wine. James discussed that he had been placed on a new medication recently for depression, and that's why he had seemed so odd. I listened as I sipped my red wine, watching him, as he appeared suddenly nervous. It all started a few years ago when my girlfriend broke up with me because she said I was acting weird. 
I didn't know what was happening, but they diagnosed me with bipolar. Everything was going well, but this last month has been a bit of a nightmare at work. I meant to ask you, have you seen the lights? I looked at him, shaking my head. What lights? In the sky. I mean, I just noticed some weird lights. I was wondering if you also had. No. I looked at him, thinking this was a weird conversation. I saw these weird lights in the sky about a month ago. I'm not sure what they could be. They hover over the house, and they fade in and out sometimes. It's almost like they're doing some Morris code. There are these orange and white orbs, and if you watch them, they go out one by one. I can honestly say I have never seen any lights. I sipped on my wine, and then I gulped the last of it in the bottom of the glass. There was this look on James's face that gave me the chills. I couldn't put my finger on it. He had this wildly excited look, and then he stood up. I'm going to finish my work now. Thanks again for dinner, Shelby, he said, and shoved a piece of bread in his mouth and walked off. I stood up and cleaned the dishes, then peeked out the kitchen window at the night sky. I didn't see anything other than stars. I thought nothing of it until a few days later, when James came home from his job and went straight to his room, slamming the door behind him. I was slightly concerned, but I wasn't sure I should bother him to see if he was okay. A few moments later, I heard a loud bang in his room. I walked over to the room he rented, just past the kitchen, and quietly knocked on the door. James, is everything okay? I asked through the door. I waited, but heard nothing. It was completely silent, and then I heard footsteps and talking. It sounded like James was talking to someone, but to whom I had no idea. It was inaudible, and then the footsteps got closer to the door. Suddenly the door opened wide and he looked at me. No, not at me, more like through me. He was panting and sweaty. What the fuck do you want? Can't you see what is going on? Did they ask you to interrogate me? James, I just wanted to know if you were okay. Fuck! He began to scream, covering his ears as though he were in pain. I took five steps back and looked at him. His nose was now bleeding, and he was screaming at the same time. Chaos seemed to erupt in a matter of seconds, and so I went into the kitchen and ran some cold water over a paper towel, and then ran back to where he was standing. Just as I held up the wet paper towel to his face, that is when I noticed it. His eyes were now rolled back into his head, and the blood was now moving in reverse back up inside of his nose. I stood there in terror, unsure as to what was happening. I couldn't tell if he was having a seizure or a stroke, to be honest, because the way he was acting, it could have been anything. He collapsed to the ground, and I called 911. The ambulance arrived rather quickly, but by the time they got there, James seemed to come completely undone. He was acting erratic and refused to go with the ambulance drivers, saying they were part of what they wanted. I thought maybe he was having some kind of nervous breakdown. They want you to take me. They want you to stop me. But I know what I saw. You won't keep me from knowing. It's too late, you bastards! He began to lash out at the EMT workers, and I had to try and keep him calm. Look at what you did to me! With that, he grabbed one of the kitchen knives and began cutting into his left wrist with his right hand. I didn't notice any blood coming out at first, but the EMT workers were trying to talk him into going with them, while one of the other guys stayed with me to ask me questions. Is he on any medications? Asked one of the workers, while the other two now managed to restrain and calm James down. James looked as though he were slowly being worn down by something. I don't know. I don't know what it could be. James mentioned he is bipolar. I said, trying to remain as calm as I could, with my eyes on James the entire time. James ended up leaving with them, and the next 24 hours he spent under evaluation at the hospital. A few days later, he came home, and while his eyes looked rested, the rest of him looked worn out. He was sluggish, and I suspected a little doped up still. I am sorry about what happened, Shelby, and I want to thank you for trying to help me. Although, I don't think you quite understand. No one can help me now. 
With that, he went into his room and shut his bedroom door, and I heard him lock it behind him. Later that night, I woke up to use the bathroom, and when I got out of bed, I felt rather strange. It was as though there was an electric current in the air. I turned the light on in my bathroom. I did my business, and then after, I saw something from the corner of my eye run across my bedroom floor. I blinked a couple of times, rubbing my eyes. Suddenly, loud music began to play, and I jumped from the startling realization it was coming from my nightstand. It took me a second to realize it was my radio. I took a deep breath and walked over to my nightstand, and on it was a small, old-fashioned pocket radio that used to belong to my grandfather. It was playing some old-time country music, and the static from it seemed to fill my bedroom. I snapped out of my trance and walked over to it, shutting it off. The room was once again silent. I had this weird feeling of unease, however, as I crawled back under the security of my covers. It took me a good 10 minutes to feel relaxed before I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I did not hear or see anything from James. I figured he needed his space, so I went about my day running errands at the local Home Depot. I had some other housing projects I would be taking on soon for a guy I knew through a mutual friend, and I wanted to have adequate supplies. When I got home from running errands, I realized I had two missed calls from an unknown number and a voice message. I listened to the message and found out that the check James had given me bounced. My bank wanted me to know because the name on the check was familiar to them. James had written checks that had jumped before. I was confused because the first check he had ever given me went through fine. I started to think about it and was worried maybe he had lost his job too, on top of everything. One thing was clear, I didn't think James was a suitable roommate any longer. I was going to have to make the tough decision to give him a day that he needed to be out. Evicting people wasn't something I had ever had to do. I was new to this landlord thing. Between the emotional outbursts, the not paying rent, the bounced check, and his violent tendencies, I didn't feel safe either. I took a deep breath and called a friend of mine that worked at the courthouse. They explained to me what I needed to do and how to do it legally. Legally, I had to give him a 30-day notice, even though the thought of it made me nervous. That would be 30 days I would have to live with him. Shockingly, James knew he had possibly given me a bounce check. This realization only made me mad because he had lied to me. I just need more time, Shelby. More time for what? I asked him. He looked at me, smirking cockily, then walked over to me nearly pushing me up against the wall I was standing near. You will find out soon enough. Find out what? James, when is the last time you took your pills? I asked, trying to remain calm and not sound condescending. You're cute. Pretty soon you'll find out that I'm not the crazy one. They are. They are here, and they're coming for you next. They can shapeshift, you know. I mean, how do you know I'm not one? One what? I asked. The ones who don't blink an eye. The ones that control our governments. The ones who don't bleed. They don't bleed? I looked at him, wishing I could crawl inside the wall to hide from him. I don't bleed either, and neither will you when they finish with you. James walked closer to me, glaring. He put his hand up my waist and then caressed my throat with his index finger. He then turned and walked into his room, locking the door behind him. I stood there, just wanting to cry. What had I gotten myself into? I was living with the world's craziest roommate, and there was no sign of a parachute. I managed to walk away from the hallway, and then slowly I carried my shaking legs up the stairs to my room and locked it behind me. I had never felt threatened by James before. He was so weird. Not that he wasn't odd to begin with, but this was just so odd. I sat on my bed trying to think of what to do next. That night, I had a hard time sleeping, and shortly after midnight, there was a bright light that lit up the entire house, followed by a boom. I thought maybe there was a car crash outside, and I peeked out my window. I could see nothing, and so I went back to bed feeling emotionally exhausted. The next morning, I crept down to my kitchen, 
fearing I would have another run-in with James like the night before. Instead, what I found was even more puzzling. I saw that his bedroom door was wide open, and there was no sign that anyone had ever been living there. The bed was made, and the closet was open, but there were no clothes on the hangers, and instead I found a large board with thumbtacked photos of papers and envelopes with no return addresses. He had extensive images of what appeared to be dead alien beings like you would see in those hoax videos. There were coordinates of different places all over the board, and photos of random houses, and the word vortex written underneath. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but I could see that there was something wrong with James. I looked around the room, looking at the fact it was so clean compared to what you would expect a place to look like that someone lived in. That shocked me because I expected a hoarder or something to be living in here, but it was as though he had never lived in here at all. On one of the bedroom walls, there was a photo of what looked like a monarch butterfly, and underneath was the name James. There were documents and things that looked like he had printed them off the internet about the CIA conducting mind control experiments. There was a docket called Monarch James. I looked at the other information and found a box full of checks with different names on them. I believed these were his other aliases. I looked around the room, and when I looked up on the ceiling, I saw a photo of Henley House and some things written on it, but the only thing I could make out was the word Vortex crudely written in black marker. I wasn't sure what I was looking at, but a chill went up my spine looking at the photo of my house. It was like he had been planning something. I wasted no time in calling someone to change the locks in the house, and I had a security system installed that same day. There was no way in hell James was coming back to this house, and I didn't care about the 30-day period. If I was breaking the law, so be it. It was around a week later, and James had not bothered to come back. I was scared he would try, so I was glad when he didn't. I eventually forgot about James over time, or at least I put it past me the best I could. Then something odd began to happen. Henley House seemed to take on a life of its own, starting with the night I woke to find myself floating in my bed. I was dreaming about flying, and when I woke up, I saw a shadow in the room with me. And when I was fully awake, I fell onto my bed. I realized this sounds completely crazy, but I started seeing things. At first, I saw only shadows, then just the other night, I was sitting on the deck with my friend Marianne drinking wine, when I noticed these lights in the sky. I pointed them out to her, but as soon as I saw these lights, they zapped out of view as quickly as they had appeared. Marianne just accused me of having too much Merlot, and shortly after that, she left. Later that night, I went to bed and then found myself awoken by something I can only describe as a shadowy being standing at the foot of my bed. In the dark of night, when you see something at the foot of your bed that awakens you, your first instinct is flight. However, I could not move and my first thought was that I was experiencing sleep paralysis. Then I heard a voice deep inside my head. Be okay. I suddenly found myself waking up in the morning around 8.30 or so, and I realized I must have just had too much Merlot. That dream was so odd, but then again, so were a lot of things. I kept denying that there was something or some presence in Henley House with me. Then it happened. I was nailing something into the wall when I saw something scatter across the room of my living room. I accidentally hit my finger, causing the nail to go directly into my finger. I looked down and immediately screamed in pain. I put my thumb on my hand and bravely pulled the nail out. As I did, I noticed there was something wrong. No blood came from my wound. It was clear liquid, but more like a gel of some kind. My heart skipped a beat. I grabbed the peroxide anyhow, and when I poured it onto my wound, it became yellow and green and began to burn. My hand turned the same color as some of the peroxide dripped down my hand into my kitchen sink. I looked at my hand and felt utterly bewildered. I thought maybe something was wrong with the peroxide, so I quickly washed my hand with soapy water and wrapped it in gauze. I finished up my renovations for the day as it now seemed to be detrimental to my health. 
Later that night, I took off my bandage to check it just before bed, and that is when I discovered where the nail had gone in was healed entirely like new. I don't know why I did it, but I took out a small needle from my sewing kit and stabbed my other hand with it. Again, there was no blood, just a thick gel-like substance. I was no longer bleeding. And just as the other, within seconds my pricked finger healed as though being sealed like a Ziploc bag. Now, I'm not sure what to make of any of this. All I know is James had warned me they would come for me, whoever they were. Now I am in some limbo, afraid to go to the doctor for fear they will tell me I'm dying. My biggest concern is that I may become something else entirely. I can feel something watching me even as I write this. Perhaps it is all connected, or maybe it isn't. Look, I know this all sounds bizarre, but just the other night I saw them. Shortly after 10 o'clock in the evening, lights appeared in the sky. At first it was only one, and then another appeared, and they kept blinking back and forth at each other before one of them disappeared, leaving just one light in the sky. The light faded in and out for over 20 minutes, and then went away. However, I managed to catch it on my camera phone. I will try to post more as I figure out what the hell is going on. Right now, I am trying to remain brave in this big old house alone. I still fear the nighttime sky as the sun sets and the sky turns dark and when the safety of daytime fades. You see, the only thing I fear now is the lights. <laughs>